Okay. Let's talk. Lydia. <laughs> Yo, you're a badass. <sighs> Takes one to know one. <laughs> <laughs> Were you always this way? Um, kind of, yeah. Love it. I mean, like, I don't know. I was, you know, I had two brothers, and I always was like, y'all got nothing. <laughs> That's the most whatever you're thing gonna ever. no totally I was like whatever you're gonna do I'm gonna do it and I'm gonna do it better mm -hmm. and um, you know the reality is that I did yeah I totally yeah. triumphed over them no I love my brothers they're awesome they're the best no I, I don't know I've just always had this like deep-seated belief that I was meant to have an extraordinary life I don't know where it came from. I mean, but I mean, I kind of know where it came from. <laughs> partly my parents, partly my upbringing, yeah. but yeah. Yeah. How about you? Oh, um, wait. What was the what did I ask you? I don't remember. <laughs> have I have I always been a badass? Oh, um, you're asking me if I've always been a badass. Yeah. You know, um, I don't know how to answer that, but I think that there was a turning point in my life in which I stopped living for other people, and I just started doing what felt good to me. Um, and just started writing my own rule book. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, I feel mm -hmm. like that was the turning point. So I don't feel like a badass, but I also yeah. just do what I want. Right. Maybe it's the same thing. Awesome. But the reason I ask that is because um, as long as I've known you, you've been an HBIC. Now, obviously, at the Huffington Post, before at the <laughs> Times, you were you know, running things there, too, in a way. And I want to know more about the earlier parts of your career when you were just a young buck upstart coming up and how you advocated for yourself because I think when you're at the top when you know you can do what you want when you're popping but there's always a point at which you are in these newsrooms and in these environments where you're the only one and yep. how do you advocate for yourself when you're literally in the minority the most minority minority yeah it's a great question I mean I remember when I was a young metro reporter at the New York Times this is ancient history and before your time <laughs> but um, I started at the same time that um, that the Jason Blair scandal was happening. And oh for y'all young people who are too young to remember, um, this was a young African-American reporter who was caught plagiarizing um, and also like making up like b trips that he didn't do to go on reporting trips. And at the time, at the times, there was a real kind of chilling effect among young um, young reporters of color because one of the sort of storylines that emerged out of that was he was pushed ahead of the line to have big opportunities because you know they wanted to have um, they wanted to to, um, to promote young people of color before they were really ready and there was this kind of on the one hand trying to tamp down that panic and on the other hand it was kind of true right I mean they're like oh see that's what happens when you move you know people mm -hmm. who aren't ready to the front of the line right and right in that period, um, they also, as part of this whole scandal, decided that they were going to start posting all jobs internally because they didn't used to do that. Because mm. another issue was that there just wasn't transparency about people getting opportunities. Mm. And if you don't know about the opportunities, it's impossible for you to advocate for yourself, right? So they posted the South Africa Bureau Chief job. And I'd been at the Times for like, you know, 30 seconds at this point. I mean, it was about a year. and. Um, it was clear that this is like an incredibly prestigious job that I was not going to get. Um, I mean, just for context, um, two of the two of the last four executive editors uh, worked as bureau chiefs in South Africa, so it's like a really prestigious post. Mm. And um, so I, I figured, you know, look, I'm like 27 years old. I've only been at the Times about a year. I'm probably not going to get this job. So I went, um, but I but I put up my hand anyway. And um, gamely, the then foreign editor said, "Sure, you know, you can come and meet with me." Right? <laughs> sort of thinking like, "Well, this will be fun." And we had this really impassioned conversation. And it turned out that he was actually from South Africa originally. Uh, you know. And his family had fled after Soweto, and you know we, we had this real bond. And I you know I grew up in Africa and in, in in East and West Africa, and so we had this real bond over this moment. And so he was like, oh, you know, maybe I'm not going to give you this job, but we actually need someone to go and fill in for six weeks um, until we can find like a grown up to do this job. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that sounds awesome. Now my editor at the time, because I was on the Metro desk, um, said, you know what? you're not ready, there are other people who have uh, earned the right to have an opportunity like that, because it's a big opportunity to go to a, another country and be a reporter. Um, and he said, you know what, you're not ready, there are other people who are in line ahead of you, and I'm not gonna move you to the front of the line, um, you're just gonna have to wait your turn. 
And I was like, no. And I went to every single person in a position of authority and power that I knew, wow. and I said, I feel like this is unfair. I feel like this is, not, this is not fair. This editor has decided that I'm the best person, and some other editor has said, you're not ready. I've got my boy down in one police plaza who's been waiting his turn to have an opportunity like this. I was the best person to send for that mm -hmm. opportunity who was available at that time. But I just had to push, you know, and I just wouldn't take no for an answer. Mm -hmm. And I pushed and I pushed and I pushed, and then finally someone overruled the, my, my Metro editor. And, um, but it's striking because there were two people who were involved in that pushing and who really made it happen. One was Sheila Rule, you know, miss her, she used to be at the New York Times, African-American woman, and the other was Nancy Sharkey, yes. um, who Nancy Sharkey. we both know because we worked with her. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really telling because like, in my career at the New York Times, what I found is that there were critical moments when I made like a quantum leap. And yeah, I think I'm a pretty pushy person and I'm very aggressive about advocating for myself. But every time I got a lift, like, like a real boost, it was almost invariably from a woman or a person mm -hmm. of color. That was, that's, been, that's been my experience throughout. My, so, I mean, when people talk about how important it is for you to look around the room and see people who look like you, people who, who share your experiences and can help li lift you up, and they weren't necessarily the most powerful people, right? We both have worked at the New York Times. New York Times is, you know, not full of powerful women and people of color. Um, there are some, but it's not full of them. Um, so they weren't necessarily the most powerful people, but they were great advocates and they knew how to work the system because they saw in me something that they were like, oh, you know, this, you know, this girl's got it. Mm -hmm. And if we didn't get to go as far as she got to go, like we're going to be the ones who are like pushing from behind to make. So I guess two things. One is like, don't take no for an answer. Push as hard as you can and find allies. And they don't necessarily have to be allies at the top. They might be people who can work all kinds of angles to make the things that happen. And I mean, honestly, I can say that getting to go on that trip to South Africa, uh, it was only for six weeks, but I mean, that set me on a trajectory mm -hmm. to become a foreign correspondent much faster. I mean, most people wait five years, you know. I was a foreign correspondent working in West Africa like a year later, mm -hmm. you know. So that's my method. It's great. <laughs> okay, now I have two follow-ups. Um, okay, how do you find your allies in a unfamiliar or new work environment? Because I think when you're younger, you're told to find a mentor, but not everyone, that, that, A, that's incredibly hard to do, and yep. also people don't always want to be mentors because yep. it, it is a big time commitment, but how, do you, how did you find allies, and how do you yourself decide who you want to ally yourself with in a new environment? I mean, it's, I, you know, this is, it's, it's funny when I say this, because like, I, I think a lot about implicit bias and my own implicit biases, and I and I know the kind of people that I'm attracted to. That that like I'm just like you're a person that I want to be around, and you're also a person of like, and they're they're almost invariably like someone who's got like really deep integrity, and who mm -hmm. um, who has like the right values, but also combines that with an ability to. Um, to work magic, mm -hmm. you know? So it's this combination of being a person of deep integrity, but also being a person who can work a system and make things happen. Um, and the sort of third ingredient of finding someone who can be a great ally is like someone who you share a passion with, mm -hmm. you know, where you can really like deeply connect. And it doesn't have to be a work thing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it's, you know, I'm like really into cycling. So at times, like I've had like really deep bonds with editors of mine around bikes and bike culture and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, sometimes it's around music, um, you know, uh, passionate interest in African music. You just have to find people who sort of, or that you can really kind of like align to and feel mm -hmm. like you may come from a, you may be like a 50 year old white guy, but we share this like fundamental passion. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one really important thing is learning how to, find allies and mentors who don't look like you. Um, I was gonna ask about that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I was on a panel with uh, our mutual friend, Shawnee Hilton from BuzzFeed, who's also an incredible badass. And she was talking about, um, you know, sort of finding ways to bond with her, like with Ben Smith, her boss, who's great, mm -hmm. but who's also like this kind of weird white dude, mm -hmm. you know? And Shawnee's like this awesome, cool black woman. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. you know, like you just sort of have to find ways to like find your, 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 your fellow humanity. Because you also will miss out if you only try right. and like align yourself with people who look like you. Right, right. Um, I, I think it's so interesting that you mentioned the Jason Blair thing happening while you were actually at the Times, because even when I came to the Times in 2009 or 2010, it's still, I still felt that shadow. Mm -hmm. And I was part of a young, 
you know, web first digital blogging initiative, <laughs> like what? But you know, and <laughs> as that's a remember thing, that. Remember those days? Yeah. We're still we're still in them. But um, it's all just blogging, Jenna. It's, <laughs> it's all, all just blogging. That's what they don't tell you. That's yeah. actually what they don't tell you. Yeah. Um, but I remember feeling really intimidated by the unspoken, that unspoken narrative and also like, do people think I belong here? Do people think mm -hmm. I'm, some, I'm a token? Do people think, you know, like, and, and anyway, I guess I'm really interested in hearing about how do you override, maybe you don't have that narrative in your head or didn't when you were younger, but how do you override those feelings of self-doubt? Because that stuff can really eat at you because we know what we're capable of, but when you're in these environments, when you're the only one that looks like you, it, it's very easy to feel like, do I belong? Like, do people think I don't belong? So how do you cope yeah, with that? Yeah, oh. it's so interesting. I mean, like, I, I have, I think the only answer really is fake it till you make it, right? You yeah. have to, like, sort of find ways to, like, remind yourself that you belong here. And when you talk to your, 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 your peer group, you'll often find, like, regardless of what they look like, they're feeling they're having the same imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. Like, maybe not the guys who went to Harvard, but um, everybody else is, like, having that same, that same imposter syndrome. Um, you know, I, I have a sort of weird and pretty unique advantage in this regard in that, you know, I spent most of my childhood um, as an outsider, right? Like, I don't have an inherent sense of belonging to any particular place. I was... You know, my mother's Ethiopian, my father's American. I spent my childhood in neither of those countries, mm -hmm. in Kenya and then in Ghana. Um, and so I've always been this kind of like rootless person who doesn't really belong anywhere, you know? So I'm black, I'm queer, I'm biracial, I'm, you know, like, ah! Uh, <laughs> and so like, as a result of that, like, I think that the only way that I could find to like live with myself was just to assume that I belong everywhere, you know, mm -hmm. that, 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 a spa that any space that I go into, I, I, you know, I belong there. I'm there, and yeah. it's just gonna have to make room for me, you know? Right. And, but I really think that that's a byproduct, uh, and, and it could have gone either way, right? I could have been the person who was like, you know, you, when you read uh, Barack Obama's memoir where he talks about, you know, looking for his identity and all that kind of stuff, um, I think he was kind of like exaggerating it. I think he's always known what he's about and who he is. Um, <laughs> But, but, I, but I think like you can either go in that direction and be like, I don't know who I am, like I don't really belong anywhere. Or you can just be like, screw it, mm -hmm. I belong where I am. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I was lucky to be born with the I belong where I am uh, personality. And mm -hmm. so I've just kind of said, I'm just gonna be. Yeah. yeah. And how has that served you as a competitive advantage in your career? That mentality, or are there other advantages that you have? Yeah, I mean, I think like, I think, I think I'm just like, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of talking like I'm this like incredibly, um, like aggressive and pushy person, but, um, but I, I'm, I think I'm just like a really relentless advocate for myself, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that I, as a, as a person who really cares about the work that I do and believes that it can change the world. Um, I get excited about it and I can help other people get excited about it and I can help other people rally around my excitement. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like that's, that's sort of been the, the way that I've gotten everything that I've, that I've wanted to do. I said, you know, I wanna cover Africa. I know I'm not really a traditional candidate for this kind of job. I know that I don't have the kind of experience that you'd normally want, but I, I just know that I can do this. Yeah. And I've somehow magically convinced people. And it's very similar with, with, with HuffPost. I mean, I'd never run a newsroom, you know, like when they, you know, when I first started talking to them about, about joining. Um, I'd never managed a team bigger than like eight or nine people, you know. And then they're like, oh, well, we have 600 journalists around the world. And, you know, you're going to have, you know, the video department and the, all this stuff. I'd never done any of that, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but I think that because I have so much confidence in myself. Yeah, you're like, no problem, <laughs> I'm like, yeah. I'm like, I could do that. And then I go home and I'm like, oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> Can I do this? But the immediate thing you do then is you're like, I need to find somebody who really knows what they're doing and like get them in on my, um, on, on my, um, on my, like get them under my umbrella and like then we can go together and do it, so. Cool. So what are your priorities now that you do have this 
you know, incredible arsenal of journalists at your disposal. I mean, coming with the, the perspective that you have, being a black queer biracial woman, mm -hmm. I mean, does that inform your priorities for running a newsroom? Oh my God, of course. I, I mean, mean, I know the answer, but yeah. I want to hear more. <laughs> yeah. I know the answer is yes, but go on. Well, I mean, <laughs> you know, HuffPost was really founded um, on the idea that People, um, and, and remember, HuffPost was founded in 2005. That's before Twitter was really a thing. It was before Facebook was really a thing. You know, long before Medium, all these other platforms in which people express themselves. Um, it was really founded on the idea that, you know, people, ordinary people should get the mic. It should be able to talk about the things that affect them in their communities and in their lives. And um, when I worked, you know, when I worked at the Times, which is an institution that I absolutely love and I think it's irreplaceable and essential, um, you know, I felt like we were really speaking to a pretty narrow, like super elite, super wealthy um, band of society, and that HuffPost as a platform had the opportunity to like just speak to like a much broader swath, um, mm -hmm. and we had this long tradition with you know the contributor network with things like queer voices, black voices, Asian voices, women's voices. We had all of these communities that were really really passionate about telling their own stories. And after working at an institution that was really about you go out find the information and tell the audience what you learned, it was really exciting to come to something that. Um, was really about listening and was really about like creating a space and community for people to tell their own stories. Um, so I'm really trying to build on that legacy. And um, you know, HuffPost started in the pre-social era, um, and you know, I think now has the opportunity to sort of like build on that platform and become the place where the most diverse and connected generation ever comes to um, to to connect and talk about and amplify the things that they care about most. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what HuffPost is up to. Mm -hmm. we're, about to we're about to embark on a 25 city tour of the United States. Um, we have like a bus, it's like a campaign bus. Um, and um, we're going around the country and the, and the the goal of it is really to talk to people about their lives, about their communities, about their experiences. And I believe that even though we're living in a moment where it feels like the country is like so deeply divided and things are so terrible, that it's a little bit of, you know, uh, I hate Congress, but I love my congressman, that when you go to people's communities, they actually have lots of reasons to be hopeful and to have a sense of solidarity and even love for one another. Mm -hmm. um, and that through connecting and listening on a human level, we can bring people together in mm -hmm. like a really profound way. And um, so we're doing a bunch of journalism around it. And like that really is sort of at the heart of the kind of journalism that we're trying to do, which is the journalism, journalism around connecting, around around listening, around bringing people together, and ultimately, if we're, if we're successful, creating a like, real platform for solidarity in mm -hmm. which people who don't really think that they have something in common can understand how they do and mm -hmm. how they can help each other. So like, do you go on this bus? I do, I'm going on Monday to the, the launch um, uh, in uh, St. Louis. Um, so yeah, no, I'm super excited. I've actually never been to St. Louis. Um, I'm gonna go on the arch, I'll, taking suggestions for other things to do, <laughs> other than barbecue, which I'll definitely be eating, so yeah. Well, the reason I ask is because you're so busy. Like you're, <laughs> Lydia, you're so busy. Like we were texting and I was like, let's talk about this talk. And you're like, I'm in Denver. And then you're in <laughs> Philly today. Now you're here and you'll be somewhere else in a couple of days. I mean, how do you maintain your sanity and how do you take, I mean, I've known you for a little while, you take remarkable care of yourself, <laughs> like you do, but what do you, I mean, how do you now with this, all these new responsibilities, prior, make sure that you continue to prioritize your own time and have that balance? Yeah, it's so important. I mean, I think there are a couple of things. Um, one is, um, you know, like, I have a great spouse my wife is amazing we've been together. she's here today i love candy we've been together for over 20 years now and she's my rock yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> she's awesome at reminding me that like you know like pulling the handbrake you know time to get off the roller coaster gotta gotta take a break um we have three dogs and which is maybe one dog too many i always say the third one was an accident a whoopsie yeah. dog <laughs> Totally unplanned. Um, and, um, surprise adoption, yeah. Yeah, it was a surprise adoption, mm -hmm. yeah. I feel like I was a little bit tricked, but. <laughs> um, 
we'll talk um, about it later. <laughs> we'll talk about it later at the we'll cocktail party. Later. Yeah. Uh, but like, I have to say, just like the simple act of like taking my dogs on a hike and a swim in a lake is like to me like the best medicine in the world. Mm -hmm. Like whatever ails you just like falls away. Mm -hmm. But I think like the most important thing is like sleep well, mm -hmm. get enough, you know, like eat eat well if you can, and remember that like nothing is more important than like your happiness and your sense of well-being, you know, and if everything were to fall away today, like, my life is awesome, so. Um, <laughs> That's my favorite thing about you. You're, yeah. you're very about that life. I right, I am about that life. Okay. Yeah. That's a perfect note to end on. Yeah. So, Lydia, Yay! thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.